I think it's pretty much common knowledge for anime and manga fans that One Piece is one of the most well-written shonen series out there. Oda is very talented at foreshadowing, world building, character writing, and at creating impactful moments. But there's definitely a noticeable difference in the writing style between pre and post time skip One Piece, which, in my opinion, is for the worst. In this video essay, I'm going to delve deep into what makes the One Piece pre time skip writing so great, what changed post time skip, and what could have been fixed to improve it. This is Supernova, your fantasy and sci fi fiction cosmic explosion, and this is The Problem with Post Time Skip One Piece. Let's get to it. So the first thing we need to do is understand what's so great about pre-time skip one piece writing. And we should do that by selecting a great example of an arc that embodies a lot of those good qualities, which is obviously Long Ring Long Land. No, it's actually Arlong Park. Overall, the Arlong Park arc is successful because it combines strong character development, emotional storytelling, engaging action, and thematic depth to create a compelling and memorable narrative. It is often cited as one of the standout arcs in one piece. And even though there are a lot of other really strong arcs to be dissected here like Alabasta, Marineford, and Eni's Lobby, I feel like this one balances these elements really well in a cohesive and relatively small number of chapters. I broke down the strong points of this arc into five categories which are 1. Emotional stakes 2. Character moments and development 3. Themes 4. Pacing and tension and 5. Relevance to the overall narrative and world building now let's talk about each of them. 1. Emotional Stakes For emotional stakes, in short, we care deeply about what happens to the arc because these results are intrinsically connected to the well-being of characters that Oda took the time to make us care for so far, mainly Nami. Up until this point of the story, we grew to like her, understand how she thinks, and feel like underneath her thief exterior, there is someone who cares about people and values Luffy for being generous and honest but we are still not 100% sure if she can be trusted. The arc makes Nami's motivation for the reader purposefully confusing until it finally reveals her gut-wrenching backstory and makes us root for her and for the Straw Hat's success even harder. We care about the Straw Hats defeating the Arlong Pirates, not only because readers in general respond negatively to injustice and tyranny, but because it deeply matters to someone we care about. As we learn about Nami's traumatic past, the arc gradually peels back the layers of her character, revealing her burning desire to free her village from the oppressive clutches of Arlong. This exploration of Nami's backstory, her complex emotions, and her unwavering determination generates profound empathy among the audience, forging a strong emotional connection between the viewers and the character. As Nami's personal struggle against Arlong and her quest for freedom intensify, the emotional stakes are further heightened ensuring that viewers are deeply invested in her journey. We desperately want Nami to win, because the idea of a literal child sacrificing years of her life to collect money and by herself carry the burden of freeing her entire village by working with the monsters that killed her caretaker, and then having that taken away from here when she finally reaches her goal after years of sacrifice, loneliness and pain, is unbelievably heartbreaking and powerful. This type of visceral emotional reaction that is carefully built on the reader to make us deeply care about the outcome of the action is something that is rarely achieved in fiction to this extent. And these heights have only been achieved once more on another occasion in the entire run of One Piece in my opinion. In this moment right here. Tell me you want to live! Say my wish just this once. And I... I want to live! Take me with you! Take me away from here! Another element that raises the stakes are the villains. The Arlong pirates, especially Arlong, feel genuinely terrifying and powerful, and Oda really establishes well how challenging it would eventually be when our heroes face against them. So the perfect recipe for high emotional stakes is successfully established. We have a very deep and emotional reason to care about the outcome because we care about the crew, we care about the village, because we care about Nami, and we have powerful villains that establish that the path to achieve this desired outcome is going to be very challenging and dangerous. 
and that's how Oda nails the emotional stakes aspects of the writing. 2. Character Moments and Development In terms of character writing, this arc is full of amazing character moments and development for our protagonists, starting with the most important one, Nami. So far, Oda has established her as greedy and self-serving, and a person that has a hard time opening up and trusting people. Throughout the arc, we get some context to understand and have empathy as to why she acts like that, which makes us see her character flaws in a completely new and redeeming light. For example, we understand that her obsession with money ultimately comes from her belief that having money allows her to protect and provide for the people she loves. And that is a brilliant bait and switch by Oda, who first establishes this really selfish and unlikable trait for the character, only to contextualize it in a way to make us see it as our favorite character trait from her, because it is deeply rooted in a very generous and altruistic reason. Oda not only masterfully recontextualizes the character of Nami for us with her backstory, but also provides some more progress on her character arc, and establishes Luffy's power of changing people's lives for the better in the moment that Nami, after spending years of her life refusing to rely on anyone to save her village, finally opens up to Luffy and asks for his help in one of the most impactful scenes ever written in One Piece. But Oda still found some time and panel real state to give small moments to the rest of the crew. The highlights I have in mind is the scene between Zoro and Nami in Arlong Park, in which Zoro successfully reads through Nami's cover and realizes that she cares about them, or Usopp's individual fight, where he finally grows the courage to face the enemy and uses his ingenuity to defeat Chu. This arc progresses each of the five Straw Hats arcs by cementing them once and for all as a deeply loyal and cohesive crew, which sets the stage perfectly for them to enter the Grand Line afterwards. 3. Themes The Arlong Park arc is also very thematically strong. Oda successfully weaves a few different themes such as fight against oppression and tyranny, world government corruption and racism into the story with great finesse. The Fishman Pirate Arlong exerts control over Nami's village and forces the residents to pay exorbitant fees. This theme of oppression is expertly portrayed through Nami's desperation to free her people, and it resonates with viewers who can relate to the struggle for freedom and justice. Oda's storytelling emphasizes the emotional weight of this theme through Nami's tragic backstory and her determination to liberate her village, making it a deeply personal and poignant element of the arc. Additionally, the arc also addresses the theme of racism, primarily through the conflict between humans and fishmen. Arlong's oppressive regime in Nami's village highlights this theme, as he imposes unfair taxes and brutalizes the human residents for considering them as an inferior race, which we later find out is actually Arlong's response to decades of fishmen oppression by the hands of humans. Through this thematic exploration, Oda underscores a broader social commentary woven into the narrative, highlighting issues like racism and discrimination in a way that resonates with the audience and invites reflection on real-world parallels. 4. Pacing and Tension To me, the most impressive aspect of this arc and that all these elements were juggled and meshed in a cohesive way, while still allowing a good pace for the narrative in a way that it didn't feel like the story was dragging or overly focusing in only one aspect too much throughout the entire thing. And all of this was achieved in only 27 manga chapters. This is particularly impressive when we consider how dragged out some of the most recent arcs are, and we still leave them feeling like the themes weren't as explored, and the characters weren't as highlighted as they potentially could, considering the high chapter count. The arc is exceptionally well-paced, with a balanced blend of action, character development, and emotional depth. It unfolds in a coherent manner, gradually revealing the layers of the narrative, Nami's backstory, and the escalating conflict between the Straw Hat Pirates and Arlong's crew. The arc manages to maintain a high level of tension throughout, culminating in a thrilling and emotionally resonant climax. 
It provides ample time for character moments and backstories, ensuring that the audience forms a deep connection with the characters, while also delivering intense battles and confrontations that keep the narrative engaging. 5. Relevance to the overall narrative and world building. Finally, this arc also progresses the overarching narrative by finally making Nami a full member of the crew, introduces Fishmen, a race that gains relevance as the story progresses, going a little more in depth into concepts such as corruption of the marine offices and by establishing the crew's growth in notoriety. So in short, Oda is able to achieve in 27 manga chapters a new location, a story with a lot of emotional stakes and character development for all main characters, while also highlighting one of them in specific. It also establishes challenging villains, a solid backstory, good action, and interesting themes, while keeping up a good pacing and a good conclusion and progressing the overall narrative. Balancing these elements so well and setting up the pieces so that the impactful moments land hard, especially in such a small number of chapters, is very hard to achieve, and it's a testament of Oda's talent as a writer. But how does the post-time skip compare to what came before? First, this video is a criticism about the writing of post-time skip One Piece but I want to highlight what Oda's more recent writing has been doing better now for the sake of fairness, before we delve into the problems. Post Time Skip One Piece is better at world building, and an interconnected narrative. It is also better at establishing engaging secondary characters, such as Law, Kid, and more recently Kuma and Bonnie. And I also believe that in terms of character design, Oda has been developing his craft a lot, with a lot of more creative and wacky character concepts making the world more expansive and diverse. Now, with the positive out of the way, let's go a little bit more into detail on what are the main problems of modern One Piece. I can summarize the problems with the writing in three main points. They are 1. Lack of character development, 2. Lack of proper editing of ideas, and 3. Pacing. Now let's talk about each of them. 1. Lack of character development. This is a glaring problem with the most recent arcs. The characters are being completely flanderized and reduced to their most cartoonish character traits, and there's no better example of that than Sanji, a character who had many facets pre-time skip and was written in a very well-balanced manner, becoming just a creepy and annoying pervert for most of the post-time skip arcs. I don't need to go into much detail on this, because the Sanji situation has been discussed to death, but I don't even think he's the biggest offender won this. Oda seems to like him enough to dedicate an entire second backstory and arc to him, so at the very least, he eventually got a good chunk of development post-time skip, which can't be really said about most of the other Straw Hats. The best highlights we've gotten for Frankie so far were a few moments here and there during Dressrosa, especially in his fight against Senor Pink. Brooke was only highlighted in a few moments in Whole Cake Island, and Robin had just a small scene saving Sanji and fighting Black Maria in Wano and don't even get me started on the missed opportunities. Wano has been hyped up as the main arc for Zoro for ages. What we ended up getting was a few character moments here and there, and no proper backstory, a character arc and personal stakes to finally give Zoro some dramatic moments. A great character that has been reduced to the badass stoic fighter of the group and has so much more to offer. But he thought it would be more fitting to use the time introducing a billion of useless random characters that wouldn't amount to anything, and would be promptly discarded once the arc was over, or introduce a bunch of plot point that wouldn't end with a proper conclusion. Another example of missed opportunity for character-centric narrative is the Fishman Island arc. Nami has been completely sidelined since Arlong Park, and this reintroduction of the Fishmen would be a perfect opportunity to bring her to the center stage once again. A simple story adjustment could be just make her initially resist Jinbi as an ally, because of her past with the Arlong pirates, and eventually throughout the arc grow, to forgive the Fishman actions and accept Jinbei as an ally and part of the team. But once again, Oda's wasn't interested in fleshing out this dynamic. The same applies to Egghead Island. The introduction of Vegapunk was a perfect opportunity to give Frankie some attention, because of his training, and even Robin because of all of Vegapunk's connections to Ohara. But once again, this opportunity wasn't taken. Oda seems to have forgotten that connecting the Straw Hat's motivations to the action is the best way to make the readers engaged with what's going on. 
In the latter arcs, the Straw Hats most of the time feel like cardboard cutouts and generic protagonists whose sole purpose in the narrative is to experience whatever is happening in the story without having a proper connection to it and establishing why this is important for our heroes. 2. Lack of proper editing of ideas It seems like because Oda was getting more prestige and trust from publishers, he started to get a bit more self-indulgent while plotting his arcs. Every single idea and character design that he had needed to be incorporated, and it felt like no thought or consideration was had to evaluate if that element really added to the story or not. The relentless introduction of pointless characters that didn't amount to anything in arcs such as Dress Rosa, with all the pointless Colosseum fighters and Doflamingo Flamingo lackeys in Whole Cake Island, with all of Big Mom's family members that literally had no point in existing, besides Oda flexing his character design creativity, and the excessive focus on Wano's side characters and the Red Scabbards bloated the narrative of these three arcs and took out panel real state that could be used for more substantial story aspects. These arcs managed to feel both incredibly bloated but also empty and lacking in substance at the same time when compared to some of the earlier arcs. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of good here. Doflamingo is the best written villain in the series. Whole Cake Island is a brilliant showcase of Oda's ability to write complex and engaging characters, with the Sanji character-centric moments, and the Gear 5th reveal in Wano is one of the most thematically fitting power-ups in manga history. But these good moments could be even more elevated if they were inserted into a crisper, less bloated narrative. 3. Pacing The pacing problem is connected to the lack of editing problem. The introduction of characters and situations that don't contribute to the overall themes and the overall direction of the arc makes it feel like the story is not advancing and it's spinning the wheels in the mud. Think of Dressrosa and how many chapters were wasted on chaotically introducing a bunch of side characters in boring fights that amounted to nothing. The whole point of the Colosseum battles was to reintroduce Sabo and establish him as the new owner of Ace's Devil Fruit. That could be easily achieved with five chapters. At the very least, if Oda wanted to flesh out a mini tournament arc a little more, make the fights more creative, and flesh out the fighters' motivations more, as it is done in more successful other tournament shonen arcs, like in Naruto and Yu Yu Hakusho. The cage situation also was dragged out for too long, to the point that it actually became less impactful than it could be. Arcs like Whole Cake Island are brilliant at being thematically cohesive, but ultimately also lack some editing and have some pacing problems. This arc explores themes of family, and how it can impact an individual by introducing several different perspectives on the topic. We have Big Mom and her twisted perception of what family means. We have Sanji's experiences with his biological family deeply scaring him as an individual, but also his experiences with his chosen families at the Barati crew and the Straw Hats shaping his values and informing the best aspects of his personality. Even smaller characters like Capone serve their purpose of highlighting another perspective on the theme for representing the family concept in a mafia type of context. However, with this solid thematic exploration in mind, what purpose moments such as the drawn-out fight between Luffy versus Cracker served that couldn't be achieved with the same degree of success in two or three chapters? What does Big Mom chanting wedding cake mindlessly for what felt like hundreds of chapters achieved for the narrative? What is the point of Prospero surviving Pedro's sacrifice? It just undermined the sacrifice moment, and the character didn't even serve any purpose in Wano to justify him being alive. The same goes for Wano. The main factors that influenced the pacing here were already mentioned. The huge amount of time dedicated to characters that eventually would just disappear from the narrative and ultimately didn't even have that much of an impact on the arc's conclusion felt once again like Oda just being too self-indulgent to recognize that not every idea he has is good enough to be incorporated into the story without editing. However, now that we have reached the final saga and Oda seems to have a rough deadline to finish the series in mind, there is hope that these narrative problems will improve. Egghead Island feels more fast-paced and lore-dense and is giving more focus to some already existing characters that needed to have their stories fleshed out, like Kuma, Bunny, and some of the elders, instead of introducing hundreds of new ones. The story is finally starting to feel like the overall narrative is converging instead of continuously expanding. 
It is a shame to think of the wasted opportunities that Oda had to streamline his story and elevate some of these arcs. I do believe that the live action, if we ever get to the point of adapting these later arcs, could be an opportunity to reduce these arcs to the narrative essentials, making the viewing experience more rewarding. Ultimately, there's still a lot to appreciate in these later arcs. I just wish Oda went back to his earlier One Piece days and took a page of his earlier writing style to refine these more recent stories. All we can hope is that for these last few arcs, the increase in pace and this self-imposed deadline to finish the series will lead to more thoughtfulness while choosing what to focus on, and that this outstanding piece of media can have a conclusion fitting of its creator's talents.